Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and open them up with me to the book of Leviticus. We're in Leviticus chapter 18. We are now going into the private affairs and God's regulation on them. And maybe there isn't anything more private than um, sexual relations. And so this chapter is all about what is permissible sexual relations. What, and more, maybe focused more on the negative. What is immoral? What are things that are outside the bounds of permissible sexual activity? And so this chapter is really going to lay that out for us in a clear way. It's interesting that uh, thousands of years later, after this was written, uh, still this is the battleground of really where we're going to live. What, how do God's people look different than the world? And there is going to be no clearer picture um, than this, um, than the way that we express ourselves sexually. Satan seems to exploit this um, Two things usually brought up with sexual immorality. Uh, one is, especially with regard to homosexual activity, we'll talk about that a little bit in our text today, um, about the idea of, well, I was born this way. Uh, let's talk about the answer to I was born this way. All of us were born sinners, which means we're going to be born naturally desiring things that are not according to God's way. We've already talked about this word, it's the word iniquity. We were born with a bend away from submitting and finding our significance in God. So keep that in mind. Um, second, uh, people use this phrase a lot. Um, don't tell me who I should love or who I can love. And the world loves to mix these terms, sex and love. First of all, the Bible says that we should love everyone. But the Bible doesn't say that I should be having sex with everyone. So the world loves to mix those terms and say that love and sex are synonymous. They are not. Uh, I'm to love everyone. Uh, but sexual relations are in the confines of covenant marriage between a man and a woman for life. And so keep that in mind. As we, before we dive into this text, I want to take you back to 1 John chapter 2. Go with me there. 1 John chapter 2. In verse 15, uh, John lays this out. He says, Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So this is exactly what Moses is trying to lay out under the inspiration of God in Leviticus. There is, are things that are holy. There are things that are profane. The things that are holy are from God the Father. The things that are profane are of this world and they're sinful. There's a clear divide between those things. Who gets to make the divide? God makes the divide. And the divide is based on his character. It's not some arbitrary, just God's up there saying, ah, let's say lying's bad and let's say the truth is good. No, God is truth. Therefore, lying is opposite to his character. He goes on and says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So he lays out, in the world, there are these three aspects. Lust of the flesh means what my body wants. Lust of the eyes, what my eyes want. Pride of life is me being the greatest, me elevating self over everything. Now. God wants me defined from my relationship with him, not defined by what my body wants, what my eyes wants, or elevating self. All those are a perversion away from God's plan for humanity. Interesting thing about sexual relations 
is that sexual relations kind of feed into every one of these. Of course, we understand that it's part of lust of the flesh, what my body wants, but it's also a, a, a visual desire. And it's also a power thing, procreation and uh, having some type of uh, power over others. It says this, verse 17, the world is passing away and also it's lust but the one who does the will of God that lives forever. Remember, marriage, sexual relations, all of these things are earthly things that will not be happening in heaven. So here, this regulation on these um, is carries on. The things that are prohibited here in Leviticus chapter 18 are still prohibited in the New Testament, and we'll see some correlation. Um, so, if you haven't already read Leviticus 18, read it now. We're going to pray, and then we'll look into it. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for a time to set aside to commune with you. And in a day and age, Father, where the world around us is trying to redefine all the parameters that you have set out. Father, may we renew our minds with this is not a new endeavor. Uh, our enemy, Satan, has been trying to do this from the beginning. And so, Father, may we be holy. May we be separate, set apart, different from the world. When people look at us, may they see it immediately in the way that we live our lives, but especially, Father, through our morals. May our morals reflect your character. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a fact. The more that immorality is tolerated, the more acceptable and the more appealing it will be. Um, we're seeing this more and more. Uh, the more that there's not shame connected with immorality, the more it's going to become prevalent. And we see evidence of that all around us. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, uh, and say to them. Now we're going to see a phrase, and I want to bring this up right off the bat. Um, a phrase that's going to say, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. So what's that phrase saying? I am your, I am Elohim your, I am Yahweh your Elohim. Lord is Yahweh. God is translated Elohim. Or Elohim is translated God here, excuse me. God, meaning Elohim, is the plural name for God, creator God. Uh, God who made everything. If we were going to take these two terms, God would be transcendent God out there, massive, powerful God, omnipotent. Yahweh would be um, the closeness. If this is transcendence, the word Yahweh would be imminence, a covenant-making God. Not only is God the creator of everything, but he's the God who has come to dwell and to have his presence in the middle of Israel. For you and I to have his presence living within our lives. So I am the covenant God who created everything. What a great picture here. What a great uh, thing to renew our minds with. God is still. Yahweh, our Elohim. And so keep this in your mind. It says, uh, and it's repeated over and over, um, to be the motivation, uh, the reason why we do not participate in the, these activities. Because the, the Lord has told us not to. And so we're not going to do what the Lord told us not to do. Um, Jesus Later on, we'll come to the Pharisees and say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do? He says, say to them, I am the Lord, your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, 
nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. So a clear cut thing that the things that are listed in this text are the lifestyle of Egypt and the lifestyle of Canaan, where they're going. Now, let's review a little bit. Where do these two countries come from? Both of them are uh, descendants from Noah's son, Ham. They're Hamites. And if you'll remember, you can go back and read in Genesis chapter 9, verse 25. The curse was placed. Um, if, if, if you remember, uh, Ham uncovered his father's nakedness when he was drunk. We're going to see that. Now, um, you can go back and watch the video on Genesis chapter 9 and uh, review that. We won't do that in this uh, text. But he uncovered his father's nakedness and God cursed him. Well, not really. He, he put a curse on his family because of Ham's lack of respect for his father, his rebellious attitude, that rebellion against his authority, his father, and a connection with God was going to play out in the rest of his descendants. And what we see is that happened. You can go to Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, and when Abram, Abram comes on the scene and God makes the first covenant with Abram, it talks about the descendants from Ham, just four generations later, being nothing but totally wicked. And now we're much further down the line here, um, 400 years after that. And so what do we find? We find that the Egyptians, the Canaanites, both were very, very immoral people. Um, now in this text, it's going to lay out the law. Okay, so what is prohibited? And then from what's prohibited, what will be the judgment if you do what is prohibited? Um, it says, you shall not walk in their statutes. Okay? Don't live a lifestyle like they live. I want you to live differently. Um, what we're going to see, and I think this plays out across uh, everything, uh, across the years, is that when we disobey God, it opens the door for confusion and chaos to come into our lives, which leads to more sin, which leads to uh, greater and greater perversions. It says, you are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. So remember, Israel had stated God had presented the covenant before them at Sinai, and they said, everything that the Lord has said, we will do. So they've already made a verbal commitment that they were going to obey God. Now, will you live it out? It's much like a marriage ceremony. Uh, when, when I say in my marriage ceremony that I'm going to keep be faithful to this woman as long as, I, as we both shall live, if I, those are just words unless I live those out from that moment on. So that being said, uh, you and I as Christians, we made a commitment on the day that we surrendered to the Lord. Now, if, if those were just words that I said when I was seven years old, then it would mean nothing. But, but when the commitment grows after that, that is proof of the reality of the commitment. He says, hey, You've already said you're going to do this. You've already said you're going to keep my judgments and keep my statutes. Now, here they are more specifically. You shall keep my statutes and my judgments, so which a man may live. If he does them, I am the Lord. Here, God, again, talking about life. Where is true life found? Eternal life is found in getting to know God. The more we get to know God, the more our lives will not be wrapped up in confusion and chaos. And that's what we're going to see. So that's the exhortation in the chapter. Hey, this is what I want. I want you, Israel, to do my judgments, my statutes. What I tell you, you've already committed that you were going to do that. 
Now, here they are more specifically. From verses 6 all the way to verse 23, he's going to give the customs that were uh, the, the, uh, the daily walk, if you would, of the Egyptians and the Canaanites. And so he says, none of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncover nakedness. Now, uncover nakedness is just a term for um, uh, the sexual intercourse. And so let's, he uses it only under the um, incestuous uh, category. We're going to see that he, he uses another word when he gets to adultery. Um, we'll see that in, in this chapter, or you've already seen it in this chapter. So here it says, I'm the Lord. Th there's a group of people, uh, a group of, uh, a list of people that you are not to have sexual relations with. Now, remember the whole focus and motive behind this is that you may live. You want to get to know God. If you want to get to know God, you're going to have to obey his judgments and his statutes. Uh, look with me at Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Look at verse 15. It says this. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 30, I was in Numbers 30, verse 15, it says this. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, so that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land of which you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you're crossing the Jordan to enter it and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. That was the promise given to Israel, but it is a natural law. If you obey God in these actions, it's going to be healthier for you. We're seeing all the perversion in our society today opens the door for uh, many other things. God's moral law reflects God's character. So when we obey God's law, we're living in tune with the way that he has created us. Outside of that, things get messed up. So he says, hey, look, you're not to have sexual relations with your mother here it says in verse 7, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. Now, uncovering the nakedness of your father means anybody connected from or that came forth from your father. It's not talking about him having homosexual relations with his father. It's talking about anybody, his wife or any of the children that came from him, which some commentators have read that into uh Genesis 9, I don't know that we, we would go that far. It says, um, so there, you're not to have relations with your, uh, sexual relations with your mother, uh, your father's wife, your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter. So this idea of even half brothers and half sisters. Um, your son's daughter, your daughter's daughter, your father's wife's daughter, your father's sister, your mother's sister, which would be your uncle or your, uh, I mean, your, your aunts, excuse me, your, uh, you shall not uncover 
the nakedness of your father's brother. So when he says your father's brother, he's not talking about having sexual relations with your uncle. He's saying anybody that came forth from your uncle, uh, your aunt, your daughter-in-law, your brother's wife. Um, so all that through verse 16, there's quite a list. Um, but I think these are still naturally held norms for the most part that are considered uh, incestual. Um, it, it doesn't talk here about um, a couple things. It doesn't talk about uh, fathers and their daughters specifically. That's one that's left out. But more than likely, that wasn't a problem. It's still prohibited. We'll see that later on. But it, apparently that was not. Um, a problem in Egypt or in Canaan. The things that are listed here were all problems um, with uh, the, the religion in Canaan and the lifestyle in Canaan and Egypt. Um, I want you to see this connection though. In, in, from chapter 17 into 18, there's this uh, caution. That if you're not, if Israel wasn't careful to preserve their worship, their worship both corporately, publicly, and privately, it was going to lead to uh, them mimicking the countries around them. And what do we find happening to Israel? Exactly that. It didn't take long before they were starting to look like Canaan. Uh, look at verse 17. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. So you, you can't uh, be married to a woman and her daughter. Uh, nor shall you take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. Um, all of these things that we're reading about, um, it, it keeps talking about nakedness. <laughs> Excuse me. Now remember, nakedness, before Genesis 3, nakedness was a sign of integrity. Nakedness was a sign of sinlessness. They were free. Uh, but after Genesis 3, and, and continually getting more perverted, was this idea of nakedness uh, being a sign of exploitation, of captivity, of abuse, of shame. And we see that today. It doesn't have to always be that, but the perversions of this come from that. Um, the Canaanites had religious fertility rites and they had sacred prostitution. And what you're going to find is all of the perversions that are spoken of in this chapter really stem from there. It wasn't as if someone is at home thinking, hey, I would like to, you know, marry my sister. No, that's most of these things happened uh, initially through the religion. Homosexuality, most believe, began uh, as a part of pagan religion, and then it flowed out from there. Uh, bestiality, same thing, started off as a uh, part of the pagan religious rites, uh, child sacrifice. We're also going to talk about that. Um, so uh, let's keep going. It says, um, it is lewdness. You shall not marry uh, a woman in addition to her sister as a rival while she is alive. So if I wanted to marry um, my sister-in-law, the, the stipulation would be one of them has to be not living any longer. So they wouldn't, I don't know. That, that's the idea of that. When you get to verse 19, it changes course a little bit from incest to um, uncleanness. And we've already talked about not having physical relations with uh, your wife during the time of menstruation. Um, here, remember what we talked about before was when this happened unwittingly. This here 
in verse 19 is knowingly rebelling against God and doing this out and out. It says, you shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness during her menstrual impurities. Um, you should, so we're going to talk more about that in the later uh, verses. We've already read some of that um, before. Um, back in 1524, it was talking about when this was unintentional. Here it's talking about intentional. Um, now, verse 20. You shall not have uh, intercourse with your neighbor's wife uh, to be defiled with her. This is simply uh, described as adultery. We've already talked about this in the Decalogue, that adultery is against God. God hates it, so don't be a part of it. Um, and it, it simply lays that out. Um, any relationship outside of marriage um, is prohibited. We're going to see this when we get into numbers and some in Leviticus, but the sexual relations were to be within the confines of covenant marriage. And anything outside of that was a perversion, was wrong. Uh, fornication is when two people who are not married, engage in sexual relations. Um, we're going to see that the punishment for that was that, that they would get married. Um, anything outside of that, any sexual relations between married people that aren't married to each other, was death. That was the punishment. Any uh, homosexuality, death was the punishment bestiality. Death was the punishment. We're going to see that as we move forward. <clears throat> Verse 21, it says, you shall not give any of your offspring to offer them to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of the Lord, the name of your God. I am the Lord. Molech was an Ammonite uh, God. And, and we can see in 1 Kings, uh, I think it's 1 Kings 11, Verse 7, that Solomon was really the first one um, to build a, a temple for a, a place for Molech. And uh, in 2 Kings, we see it getting worse, people sacrificing children. Jeremiah 32, you can see the same thing. One of the things about Molech was that it would, you can read this later. It would talk about your children passing through the fire of Molech. Um, now, there's some discussion about what that means. Uh, sometimes people feel like it means child sacrifice or child service. So either equally difficult. So in worshiping Molech, um, sometimes people would bring their children and they would dedicate their children to Molech and their children would become temple prostitutes. Uh, what we might call that child trafficking now. Okay. Um, the, the, the even worse part of this was Molech uh, being the place where you come and sacrifice your child. Um, it was thought that there was a big metal uh, idol with hands and there was a fire under the hands so that the hands would become red hot and that they would take a baby and put the baby on the red hot hands and it would uh, kill the baby. And that's what that turned into. Um, God is saying, don't have anything to do with that and we can understand why. Uh, verses 22, uh, verse 22 talks about homosexuality. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. People like to say, well, nowhere in the Bible does it talk about uh, homosexuality being wrong. Well, clearly here it does. Um, and then, then there's all kinds of things of, of why and trying to... The, the basic thing is... All of these perversions are God's way of saying, this is out of bounds. 
This is inbounds. Inbounds is a husband and a wife in a covenant of marriage for life. Anything out of it, a man and a woman, anything outside of that is outside of the bounds of God's judgments and God's statutes. Okay, But clearly today, even people who profess Christ want to somehow try to crawfish on this. I want to go to a couple chapters, uh, passages, and go to Genesis 1 with me. I mean, not Genesis, Romans, excuse me. Romans chapter 1. In Romans... Uh, chapter 1, look with me. It says in verse 26, For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. And what we're going to see in Leviticus is these degrading passions. Meaning, it's, it's the perversion is getting worse. It's going to go from uh, incest to homosexuality to bestiality. It's going to get worse. Okay. Um, it says, their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way, also men abandon the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. So, Again, we're seeing in the New Testament the same idea in the Old Testament, is that this is a perversion, that God's not going to bless this, and it's going to uh, degrade and uh, bring chaos and confusion into your life. It's not going to help you live. It's not going to help you be successful. And we see evidence of that all around. Yet people, because they have bought into the lies of Satan, Continue the lifestyle of such. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He's, interestingly enough, giving a uh, discussion about lawsuits. But in it, he, he talks about loving others and that we should def go ahead and take the hit ourselves rather than defrauding someone else and then and then he goes into this um verse nine or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither fornicators that's people who have sexual relations outside of marriage idolaters people who put anything in front of god adulterers people who break their marriage vows uh, effeminates that's the, in a homosexual relations, that's the one who acts like the more passive, uh, if you would. Uh, nor the homosexual, that's the other partner in that. Uh, nor thieves, people who steal, nor people who want what their neighbor has, nor people who get drunk, nor people who fight, nor people who cheat will inherit the kingdom of God. Well, now that's quite a list. Uh, in the church today, we like to say some of these things are worse than other things, but God seems to group them all together. And I would tell you this, whether regard to coveting what my neighbor has or cheating on something or uh, homosexual activity, all of them are perversions. All of them are things that God's saying, this is not what I'm going to produce in your life. And when you see these things coming up in your life, deal with them as sin. Confess them, repent of them, and move forward in a right walk with God. You're not going to be able to walk in these things. I'm not going to be able to be a coveting of what my neighbor has and be living in a right walk with God. I'm not going to be able to have sex outside of marriage and be right with God. I'm not going to be able to cheat on my wife and be right with God. I'm not going to be able to engage in homosexual activity and be right with God. Okay, So keep that in mind. Uh, whatever people want to say as far as what we can do, what we it hasn't changed. Morality, according to God, has not changed since Genesis 1 and 2. Um, Get to verse 23. Also, you shall not have intercourse with any animal to be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. In It is a perversion. This was 
part of their fertility right this was part of their worship this was part of the exhibition that they did to get people into the temple to give money um, now from verses 24 to 30 he's going to give us all of the the judgment what's going to happen if you do engage with these things it says do not defile yourselves by any of these things for by all these things, the nations which I'm casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled, therefore I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has spewed out its inhabitants. Get the picture. Just as we've been talking a lot about when you, when you bring things into the tabernacle, you defile the tabernacle, therefore the tabernacle has to be purified. Here, he's saying the same thing. Sexual immorality defiles the very land. God owns the land. We are inhabitants of God's land. And when we live immoral on that land, we're defiling the land. And the picture here is that the land gets an upset stomach and vomits it up. What vomits out is the people who are inhabiting the land getting taken out. We're seeing evidence of Canaan being kicked out of the land. What we'll see later on is that Israel getting kicked out of the land by Assyria and by Babylon. That's the idea. It says, but as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. For the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations and the land has become defiled so that the land will not spew you out should you defile it as it spewed out the nations which has been before you uh, they didn't believe this and they did exactly what God told them not to do it says whoever does any of these abominations those persons who do so shall be cut off from among their people Remember, we said this cut off from among the people is direct act of God stepping in. Now, people love to use this to talk about homosexuality and say that God's going to judge that. But in all of these areas, whether it's adultery, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's any sexual perversion at all, God says, I'm the one stepping in. If you go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about every sin that I can commit is outside of my body except for sexual sin. Any sexual sin, I'm actually sinning against myself. I'm actually willingly wanting to bring pain on me. So when we, it says, thus you are to keep my charge that you do not practice any of the abominable customs which have been practiced before you, so as not to defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. He, he's saying, look, my people should look different than the world. Now, we've talked about this. This doesn't change under the new covenant at all. Should God's people should the morality of God's people in the church look different than the world, the culture around us? And the answer is, the, the ought is that we ought to look different. The is is that we don't. We look almost exactly the same. And this is a big problem. And until God's people, until the church today, starts to see this until it breaks our hearts, until we will fall on our faces for our past fornication, for our past adultery, for our divorces, for our homosexuality, for our perversions of God's morality. Then God's going to take his hand off of us and we will flounder. It will be as if the earth is throwing us up. May God honor uh, the reading of his word today. Father, we love you. We pray that you will help us be set apart today. Father, reveal to us places in our lives where we have rebelled against you, both personally and corporately. Give us the courage to confess our sins today, both to you and to each other. 
And Father, may we turn from these things in repentance. May we walk fresh and anew in seeking you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.